Hello, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. I'm Nuno da Silva and I'm hosting today this conversation with a wonderful couple of friends and mentors, Alan Kaplan and Sue Davidoff. Welcome, my dears. Thank you, Nuno. Welcome so much. I'm really, really happy to have the chance to have this conversation with the two of you. You are co-founders both of Proteus Initiative. You've been working uh, in the field of community development and education in the case of Sue for many years. You are based in South Africa. Um, Alan has worked as a facilitator, writer, consultant, and teacher, helping people to stretch their processes of inner and outer development to greater edges and depths. Um, and uh, you, you worked for a long time in an organization in, in Cape Town called Community Development Resource Association, um, and later found Proteus Initiative. You wrote two books, The Development Practitioner's Handbook and The Artists of the Invisible, which are quite, quite remarkable uh, books for anybody trying to think development in a different way. And Sue, you also have been a facilitator, a teacher, and a writer. Uh, you, you helped to bring this Gautian inspired understanding and methods to the sphere of social and environmental change, activism and stewardship. Prior to founding uh, the Proteus Initiative, you've been former director of the Teacher in Service Project, where you provided organizational development support to educational institutions at local, provincial, and national levels in South Africa. You are also author, amongst other works, of The Learning School and Courage to Lead and Changing Your Teaching. Uh, so... A lot of, I mean, this this obviously doesn't honor and, and pay homage to your life's journey, which is much more rich than these few words. So it would be great to just maybe start by inviting the two of you to share a bit of your journey and how that led you to do the work you are doing today with what we call reflective social practice or this Gautian um, phenomenology applied to so to the social to the to social change and social to social uh, development could you tell us a bit about anyone would like to start a bit about how how your journey has led you to this work okay thank you Nuno. thank you for inviting us to participate in this process this program that you're so intimately involved with um we feel very honored to be invited to be with you today. So thank you very much for that. Uh, <clears throat> um, perhaps it, it is proper or important to say that Alan and I have been working together in the Proteus Initiative since 2006, but we're also life partners. So for those people who don't know, because I think it really does somehow it, it becomes a relevant um, piece of information in the story. So my background, as you mentioned, is in education, and I worked for many, many years at a university in Cape Town called the University of the Western Cape, where I was the director of the Teacher in Service Project, which was based in the Faculty of Education. And our work was really to support teachers in their teaching practice in a context where um, the notion of teaching was a very, very impoverished notion. It still is largely in South Africa. And historically disadvantaged schools, educational realities are really, really very difficult. And um, during the course of that work, I discovered very soon, entered, that it was not... Um, helpful to be working with individual teachers, that the holding ground for these teachers of the school that they were operating in was very important and that we needed to work with leadership and management 
and looking at the school as a living organism. And that um, took me down a very, very interesting pathway. And Alan, at the same time, and he'll speak about it in a moment, was working very strongly with organization development in his context. So there were many intersections between the work that I was doing and the work that he was doing. And at a certain point, completely independently, we both felt that we'd come to the end of the road in this work that we were doing because we were in search of and scratching at the door of something which felt much deeper and more foundational. And that was looking at how do we really begin to understand organizations and social organisms as living and to work with those living organisms in ways which supports and honors life rather than thinking about them as entities which have problems which we as consultants come in to fix. So it was very much a sense of how do we begin to understand something which is alive in the social sphere? How do we begin to understand what's really going on in that organism so that we can support its own process of unfolding? And this led us to ask the kinds of questions that took us to the United States of America, where we started, um, we, where we became students of um, Goethean science. And Goethe's science is very much the science of understanding living process in the plant world. And we started moving towards understanding how we can translate that which belongs in the living natural world as living process. And of course, we could spend hours talking to you about that into the social realm. So I think I'm going to stop there and let Alan speak a bit about his biography and perhaps connect with what I'm saying. So I'm going to try and do that. Thank you, Nuna. It's good to be here so to speak. Um, um, so I would start by saying that Sue and I perhaps are life partners and work partners because we share a common sensibility. And I want to talk a little bit about that sensibility in a minute. But ever since um, I have always been engaged with the question of why we are here and where we are going, we as human beings, and um, in South Africa, during the days of apartheid, it became necessary to work, let's say, for social change. And, um, and so I got involved in community development, in rural community development, in organization development. I did found the Community Development Resource Association that you mentioned earlier, which was founded intentionally on an alternative way of looking at development work. Because, um, and in a way, what was started in the Community Development Resource Association, we have taken further into the realm, let's say, of life itself through the protest initiative. Um, and the understanding that we developed, because, because I founded the Community Development Resource Association out of a sense of frustration on the one hand, and intention to something else on the other. And the frustration is that I discovered that all of us who work with change were working with change in an instrumental way. We would intervene into situations in order to change those situations. And there was always an element of manipulation, of instrumentalization in those processes. We were outside a situation that we needed to change. What we have developed over the years, um, and Goethean science is, is a major proponent and foundation of this, is the understanding that life is in constant movement. Life is in constant change. We don't change life. Living is a process of change. Every moment that we live, we are changing. None of us 
none of the three of us here or anybody who may be listening or watching is the same as they were yesterday. You certainly know you weren't the same as you were 10 years ago. Your face is changing all the time. Your body is changing all the time. Your, your thinking is changing all the time, I hope. Um, so this process of change means that whenever we enter into a situation, we're entering into a situation, a sacred situation, because it's, it has its own integrity. It's not dependent on us. So when we enter into situations, we enter understanding that change is already taking place. We may be trying to guide sometimes, to facilitate, to help, but we're not trying to create change. And we're not trying to engineer change. So the sensibility that we share, and I think the sensibility that brings us to, into a Goethean approach, the foundational, as Sue said, the deeper and foundational aspect, is that we enter recognizing that the more we can see when I say we, I mean anybody in the situation, anybody in that social situation, the more we can see, the more the situation will change of its own accord. We don't go in to instrumentally shift things. We go in only to learn as much as we can and to help people inside the situation to learn as much as they can of their situation. So, we, we, we uh, foreground practices of observation and we, and we background practices of direct intervention. Or let's say the intervention is an attempt to enable people to see themselves and their own situation. So that's what we do in the Protest Initiative. And it is an attempt also to recognize that and here's another common sensibility, that nothing out there is going to change unless we change. We're not separate from the world that we're working in. We are implicate in every aspect of the world that we're working in. In fact, we're creating it all the time. It is up to us to change. So we work a lot with the inner nature of social change and not only with the outer. And by inner, you mean our own our own processes of transformation as practitioners and everyone we're exactly. working with. Yeah. yeah, which is why we call it a reflective social practice. It all hangs on this idea that of, of reflection. That we begin through reflection to see what we are doing, to understand what we are doing, to make meaning of the world around us. And as we make meaning the situation changes rather than we have to change the situation. There's, there's a lot of things, a lot of questions coming for me, so I don't know where to start. Um, so one crucial thing that you mentioned that I think is relevant also in the context of the summit and, and understanding the nature of conflicts and, and how, how we respond in those situations is this sense of that the way we think about conflict will already kind of shape how it unfolds somehow, right? So if, if, if I think conflict is a problem, Conflict will be a problem. It will be maybe even a bigger problem. So the way we think affects the way we see. Um, and another thing that I think is really interesting for the context of the summit is this idea that change is is part of any living process, and that. You, we don't need because in the in the activism and social change world, there's this kind of uh, idea or, or practice that you, you you change is dependent on the quantity of energy you put. The more you, if only we do more, it will mm -hmm. eventually change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very problematic if we think that the amount of energy spent in the last decades on change 
and where we are at today uh, compared with the early 70s and in many ways we are much in a much worse place as as yeah. a as a humanity in, in the planet, you know. So there's this very interesting aspect you are bringing that that kind of makes me question the relationship or the understanding of of, of the difference between conflict resolution and what we were trying to bring with the idea of conflict transformation. That's kind of part of the name of this summit, which is that conflict resolution involves that kind of you know, we have to act and that kind of intervention that you were saying, that you instrumentalize, you have someone coming in or that we have to sort this out and clean the mess and, and keep going. You know, that's as long as we keep going, everything's going to be fine. And this uh, uh, kind of op is opening me this door of, well, then maybe what we need to do is to observe ourselves and each other in that conflict situation to try to see to reflect on what is really happening here and see what are the dynamics at play. And if we see more together, then the situation will unfold without needing to put, uh, to, to kind of fix it or, you know. So that, that was what's coming for me. I don't know if that rings any bells for, for us to, to move forward in the conversation, but I just wanted to share with you that was a bit what was emerging. Yeah, I, I would like to respond to what you're saying. I think that when I listen to you, what comes to me is that um, there is a certain, um, I suppose, stream of activism which wants to do to a situation, to resolve a situation, to improve a situation, to challenge a situation, to to um, mobilize against a situation. And it's not that any of these things are wrong. I think that there is a place for all kinds of activism in the world that we find ourselves in. But essentially, I think that when Alan said, um, the more we can see, the more the situation will change itself. I think it's a it's a kind of a primary gesture that we're trying to cultivate that through practicing observation of a phenomenon, whether it's a natural phenomenon or a social phenomenon, and really learning to see it on its own terms without our impositions, without our judgments, without our assumptions, without our expectations, without our expectations or our own needs and constantly checking in to see what's happening inside ourselves the more we can see that situation on its own terms, the more that situation will reveal itself. And always with any situation, with any phenomenon, whether it's natural or social, what we are dealing with in life processes is the process or our, pro, our polarities. Everything that is alive is a polarity. And a, a very significant part of our practice is working with polarity and understanding that polarity is a dynamic expression of the life process. So that really gives a fantastic um, basis for not taking sides, not taking up a position, not saying we're on the side of the good guys and those are the bad guys. It's a very wonderful place for not othering because when you realize that each pole of a social situation um, is embedded in and completely intertwined with the other, then you realize that a certain practice is needed which can help to both strengthen and transform both poles. And perhaps just to give a, a very um, uh, simple example, the polarity of light and darkness that we all know so well. We actually could not know what light is if there were not darkness. And we could not know what darkness is if there were not light. But we tend to look at the light as positive and the dark as negative. And how do we somehow get rid of that rather than recognizing that darkness 
whatever it is, has a force and an energy. And the more we can lift it into awareness, the more we can work with that in ways that is that are transforming for both itself as darkness and the light. And I guess that um, discipline of real observation um, enables us to allow these realities to reveal themselves in this living phenomenon, understanding that it is always in movement, and therefore through that, helping that organism to understand itself, especially a social organism, and in that way find its own, rather than solutions to a problem, its own understanding, and in the understanding, the situation has already transformed itself not necessarily resolved itself, but transformed itself. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yes, Can it I? makes a lot. I think Alan also has something to say. Yeah. So no, I, I now want let's to circulate. I, I want to say, I, I want to give a specific example of a practice uh, along the lines of what Sue's talking about, but it just strikes me that these words, resolution, transformation, they're all, they all assume the problem. They all assume that there's a problem that we have to somehow change. We have to help you change it or you have to change it for yourself and so on, rather than recognizing that this is a moment in the life of this evolving social situation or being. And the more it can understand where it is, the more it will find its wholeness and its paths of moving forward. But the, the, the specific example of bringing observation into the forefront is that we sometimes do this exercise. If we're working with people over time, in other words, we're with them and then they go home and they come back and we're with them again over these periods of time. There's an exercise that we do sometimes. We ask them to find somebody in their lives who is who, with whom they're feeling difficulty. Perhaps conflict, but conflict's a big word. Maybe, maybe it's conflict. It could be outright conflict, or it could be an unsettledness or a dis-ease or a, or a rejection or an from one way or the other, an irritation. Something's not working with this person. Could be your boss, could be your partner, could be at home, could be at work. Somebody. Um, somebody where there's a charge like this that's not comfortable. And you try to resolve it. You try, you, 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 because you're the, the good one, after all, and the other person is, is not. <laughs> so you try to resolve the situation, and it doesn't get resolved because this person is not really right, or maybe I'm not right, or it's not working, all the things I try to do. So we ask people now to go back and not try to do anything anymore. Not try to do anything, not try to change it, not try to change yourself, not try to change the person. All we want you to do whenever you are with that person is to observe. Observe consciously. Pay attention. Pay attention to what this person is doing. Not judgmentally, not critically. Just pay attention to what the person is doing. And pay attention to what you are doing. And Pay attention to what you're feeling. And when you finish that interaction in the morning of coffee, something's happened, you go and you hide yourself away and you take some notes. You scribble down notes because otherwise you're going to forget and you can't take notes while you're observing, obviously. So you write down notes. It's important to write down because otherwise you do forget. And then slowly you build up a journal of observations. We're not asking the person to do anything with those observations, just to see more, to learn more, so that the situation becomes more transparent to itself. The situation, the relationship becomes more transparent to itself. Because if you can see more, then the situation is more transparent. And it's only about observation. You don't try to do things differently. That's all. And then you come back when we meet again, come back and tell us what you observe. It's a very, very amazing thing. Because without fail, that situation starts changing. Without fail, the, the, the conflict begins to turn. The person who is being observed begins to shift. 
you begin to shift, something begins to turn, and without doing anything to change the situation other than observe, those situations resolve themselves. People change. Um, it's quite an amazing thing to experience someone paying attention to you. Uh, someone who before was rejecting you. You didn't even understand quite why. And now they're paying attention. And you start paying attention too. And as soon as we start paying attention like that, you're no longer in a conflictual modality. I'm not saying these things don't go back. Life is life doesn't change in that way. And the exercise is not done in order to change or to resolve conflict. It's done as an observation exercise only. Just observe. Could you tell us a bit more, like, if we think in terms of the practice, a bit more about what, what kind of gestures it involves? Because you're talking about something that you mentioned already, observation. So all... The, the starting point is always observing the phenomena, observing myself not to project my own ways of thinking and seeing onto the, 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 the situation or the, the phenomena, and then observing um, yeah, the context around, like where the so to, to kind of have, have this picture of the phenomena in the context and then myself and make sure that I'm not. Uh, putting myself into the situation and allowing the situation to to show itself, and then how is the, the then the part because you mentioned this also involves reflection. So I'm kind of curious, like if you could tell a bit more how to work with these two aspects of it. So observation, you already mentioned a bit, reflection, how it enters the picture. So. Shall I start? Okay. Um, I guess you mentioned the word gesture, and perhaps the most important gesture that is necessary as a reflective social practitioner is that of interest and curiosity in the world, in the world around us, in ourselves and in one another. If there is no real interest, then in a way, all these practices can become mechanical and formulaic. So um, the gesture, the first and most essential gesture is that of real interest and real curiosity. Perhaps the second thing that feels really important is an awakening of our senses, because we very often rely on our sense of sight at the expense of pretty much every other sense that gives us an, a deeper, um, more information about the world which we find ourselves in. So an activation and a strengthening of our sense perception is very important because with our senses, we're not trying to interpret we're not trying to filter. We're not trying to discriminate in any way. We're just trying to um, make visible to ourselves as much as we possible, possibly can that is available to us with our senses that has got nothing to do with interpretation or judgment. We are gathering as much as we can from our sense of touch, which these days becomes quite difficult, from our sense of smell, our sense of sight, our sense of hearing, listening to the quality of another person's voice can tell us an enormous amount about where that person is. Observing and really, really stretching ourselves. And very often we do a lot of plant observation because that is a very helpful way of really building the discipline and the faculties that are required to become reliable, rigorous, astute observers. So that's all on the one side is really strengthening our sense perception through activating our senses and learning that there is absolutely in any living situation, there is no limit to what we can observe. And the more we gather from our observations, 
the more we already begin to understand. So here's a polarity, or perhaps, yeah, and that is observation on the one hand, using our senses, and on the other hand, we have our understanding, the meaning that we are making of what it is that we are observing. How do we start to remain faithful to these observations, but pull them together in such a way that they start to form a picture that helps us see what it is that we are witnessing or observing. And so it's observation on the one hand, understanding on the other hand, or we could say observation on one hand and reflection on the other hand, because when we begin to reflect on our observations, we are in the process of making meaning of it. So I would say that that is probably one of the most critical elements of this practice is working with a polarity of observation, sense perception, and understanding, reflection, thinking on the other side. I just want to add just a couple of things that strike me as Sue is talking. The one is that for me, there is a kind of a golden rule of Goethean observation. And that for me is you never observe whether it is smelling or listening or seeing, you never observe in order to do anything with what you are observing. As soon as you, be, as soon as you bring in this, this thing, I'm doing this in order to develop a strategic plan. Or to or, solve a club. Or to it. solve, a, yeah, or in order to help this person. Um, or in order to help this situation, as soon as you're doing that, you're not observing anymore. You are, you are intervening into a situation with intent. So to observe without that little phrase, in order to do anything, but just purely to understand, of course, this is very challenging for us. For social activists, that this kind of observation is hugely difficult. We are wanting to change things. We are urgent about changing things. If I'm a consultant, I'm called in in order to help, in order to give advice, all of this stuff. What we're saying is that there is another level of observation, and it's a very radical thought, that when I'm observing, I'm observing not in order to get anywhere, but simply to understand. That's the one thing. The other thing that really struck me when Sue was talking was the word that she used, interest, to show real interest. To have real interest. To have real interest. Mm. And I, well, yeah, that's what <laughs> I was going to say. And I suddenly thought, with this word interest, you can't fake it. You can't pretend to have interest. You have to actually be there and be present. If we are in the middle of this conversation, and my cell phone goes, and I say, hang on, I just have to take this call, that says something about my interest and where my interest really is. And all of us struggle mightily with these kinds of things. Mm. You can't fake it. You can't fake being present. You can't fake uh, the intentionality that it involves. It is an active gesture. Of, and it's an actu active gesture of respect, of openness. I have to listen enough that I can take you into me. To understand you, I have to open myself. So it's a gesture that is both opening as well as very intentional and very focused at the same time. It's another polarity, actually. Mm. Um, active and receptive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the other polarity is what Sue was talking about, this, this thing. We're using our sense perception in order to observe, but we're also using our thinking. We're making meaning. We are reflecting all the time. And often we think, and this is perhaps another, what I think of as a radical aspect of this practice, we think, well, um, we have to do, and then we have to reflect on our doing. And what we're saying is that it's not good enough, actually. We have to be reflective as we're doing. The, the, the action and the reflection is simultaneous. It's not sequential. Um, and that requires us to be very awake. 
um, to be present to a situation is not to lose yourself in it, but it is at the same time to become one with it. So th there's another polarity that we have to work with. How do we get inside a situation so that we can understand it from inside and at the same time be there to hold that situation from the outside? Because we also have to be outside. That's very interesting because one of the things that, for instance, I've noticed in different um, spaces of change these days is this, this kind of polarity of this, this op kind of opposing forces between people who are more oriented for inward uh, work and people oriented for outward. So there's always, there's always this kind of, if, if you gather a group around, some, some of this happens in the, in the transition movement where you have like people who just want to have this orient, orienting, orientation to action that we need to do more and, and you know, to, in order to change. And others who are more, let's pause and, you know, uh, be, be present with our, with our feelings and our thoughts, our emotions, and talk about it so that you can be, you know, grounded from a place that then maybe we can act. And there's always this friction between these, these, uh, these different, uh, yeah, different perspectives of how, how to be in, in, together in a, in a space that is aiming for change. And I'm, I'm finding curious because what I'm hearing you say is that th there's there's kind of a movement because there, there's a, a, there's this polarity inward outwards, uh, and that actually both come together. We need to work with both. We cannot just work with one separately. Am I hearing it hearing right? Or is... yeah, what what is that beautiful quote from Goethe that there is no inner, there is no outer? Holding. All this close. Yeah. Goethe hold says, there is no inner, there is no outer. Um, hold this close, something about a holy secret. Yeah. And um, what, as you're talking, no, no, um, I'm thinking that, yes, there is a difference between understanding polarity as the dynamic of living process and polarization. And in a way, I think that what happens as the shadow aspect of the dynamic of polarity is that there is a polarization into one side or the other. And what that means, as I said earlier, is that it, it then means that we are othering the other side. And when we can begin to understand the nature of the dynamic relationship in the polarity, that's already through observation, we can begin to work with that through observation in ways that make us not feel like we have to take a stand on one side or the other. Can I share another little story that just I remembered now, um, which is part of, I think, how we see things, and that is that we were working in New Zealand at one point, and then we flew back to South Africa. So New Zealand for South Africa is 11 hours difference. So when it's nighttime there, it's daytime here. There's also a difference in the sense that New Zealand is an island, so the sea is all around, whereas South Africa is a land mass, and it's a huge land mass. So after some weeks in New Zealand, we flew back to South Africa and we landed in Johannesburg, but we live in Cape Town. So we had to get to Cape Town, which normally we would fly. But this time we decided to drive. So we drove, it's about a thousand kilometer journey. And we drove through the, the little Karoo, the big Karoo in South Africa. It's kind of a semi-desert area. And we drove through the, till nighttime and then we slept and we got up very, very early the next morning when it was still dark and we drove and as we drove through this absolutely barren desert landscape um the the darkness started disappearing on one side of us and the light started appearing because day was turning to night night was turning sorry to day. Night. night was turning to day but in new zealand we were still part of where where day was turning to night, we could still feel 
we were so close still in that sense, we could feel our night turning to day and still experience their day turning to night. And suddenly we realized that this, the, we say the day changes to night or the night changes to day, but suddenly this realization dawned, nothing's changing. There's no change taking place. There is only a turning. The night is turning to day. The day will turn to night. The night will turn to day. There, you, you, you go deeper and deeper and deeper into one polarity and it starts turning into its opposite. That's in the nature of a living organism that one moment turns into the other. And we keep talking about change. But we talk very little about the natural organic movement of turning. So when we go into situations, we always know that the situation is turning. And in fact, to the extent that it's not turning, to that extent it's in danger. Because that which is not turning is beginning to die. Mm. So it's, 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 it's not to go in and change. It's not about social change. It's about getting inside of the processes of turning that take place in social situations as they evolve. And in relationships, all relationships turn. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for that. We, we are getting close to the end. So I was thinking, like, what is it? There's, there's so many questions. Which, which should be the one to, to finalize? Um, so we talked about, let me see, maybe we just go a bit into some of the things we touched upon. So observation, observing ourselves as we observe any phenomena, in this particular case of the summit could be a certain conflict situation we are having with someone or in a group. Um, observing without... Being, being sure that is, is not like we're going with the lenses of trying to solve it or trying to sort it out, trying to manage it or to come to a resolution, but actually with the curiosity, with the willingness, uh, inner inquiry into what is really happening here, what mm. is, what is in the, at the heart of this situation. And, and so getting away from othering other or taking sides or if we, if we are in the middle of the situation, othering the other and saying the other is wrong, I'm right. Or Then there's this, uh, there's this aspect of, after uh, together with observation, of make meaning, making meaning, of understanding, trying to understand. And as we do this, we start to become familiar or be familiar with certain aspects of the dynamics and of, of the living process, that there are patterns, right? There's patterns in the, in the ways things relate with each other over a, 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 a movement or a period of time. And we didn't call it patterns, but I'm thinking like, for instance, for me, polarities, this work with polarities is, is in a way is, is a pattern. We understand that all living process moves through those the dynamic of, of those forces, right? That's what I got. Correct me if I'm wrong or, or just just respond. And so if we approach things with curiosity, if we sharpen our senses to be fully present to the situation, the things will start to, to show themselves, to reveal themselves to us. The situation will reveal itself to 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 the to the seeker, to the one who wants to, or the observer, the one who wants to understand more, to, to, to real, uh, what's really going on. And that challenges a lot of what is the common understanding about how to approach a situation of conflict, how to be in, in a relationship when conflict arises. I think that's very useful. I don't know if there's something else that is coming for you to add. There's a lot of things for me, but, but we, we have no time. So I just want to offer the space still for you guys to, to share something, something as we, as we, just before we close. The beautiful picture you presented, Nuna. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nuna. Perhaps I just want to say one thing, and that is that we don't foreground any particular social issue as part of what it is that we are trying to work with in our 
practice from the from the Proteus Initiative. We're not foregrounding uh, gender discrimination or domestic violence or gender-based violence or um, or white privilege or male dominance or whatever it is, or conflict resolution or conflict management or conflict transformation. We're not issue-based. We're, the practice is about learning to see and learning to see more and more with the understanding that the way we see the world changes the world that we are observing. So how can we learn to observe accurately, expansively, openly, without judgment, so that the depth and breadth of life and people and social situations can reveal themselves to us and to themselves in their fullness. And I want to add one thing. Your program is called Coming Down to Earth. And it really strikes me how, I don't know why you're calling it Coming Down to Earth, but I think I, I want to add to what Sue's been saying, what is hugely important for us and maybe more important now than ever during this time of COVID-19. This is not a practice of observation that is directed solely to other human beings. It is directed to the earth. And the more we can take our place on the earth and pay attention to the earth with love, the more we can observe what is happening around us and try and understand the earth and all that lives on her, not, not because we're trying to use something or we're trying to find a solution to something or we're trying to exploit something or we're even trying to help something, but simply to pay attention, not just to us, not just to social situations, but to the earth on which we live and how we are relating to earth. Feels very much part of Goethe's intention and very much part of this practice. And I would say very much part of, of, of some of the drives that uh, brought us to organize this. So I'm so thankful and grateful for this time and for having this opportunity to, to have this conversation with you. We, we've talked quite often, but it's not often that we have this kind of conversation. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. I hope everybody enjoyed. And you can follow a bit more of work of Alan and Sue through the website of Proteus Initiative. And I really advise you to do that. For me, it has become a, a foundational work. So thank you so much for taking your time to be here. Thank you, Nuno. Thank you for this thank opportunity. You, Very nice.